In this video, we're going to go through an end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline. We're going to start from raw data, go to feature engineering, register those features with the feature store, train a model from training data generated from the feature store. We're then going to use scikit-learn to train that model. We're going to save the model to HDFS, our file system. We're then going to run that model over the network. So we're going to use model serving to make that model available and we're going to have an application that will make predictions using that model. We're going to do all of this in a single Jupyter notebook, believe it or not. Okay, let's get started. So use the admin password to log in. In this case, we're going to use the deep learning project. It was created using this deep learning tour over here. So let's go straight into that project. Demo deep learning project. Now, <coughs> this case we're going to use the feature store and normally what would happen is that the feature store would appear as a service here on the left hand side but we can see it's not visible and what that basically means is it hasn't been selected yet so I'm going to go to the settings tab and we can see in here that there are a number of services that haven't been enabled for this project yet because when you create a project you can opt in and enable a bunch of services and the tour didn't select these services so I'm going to enable the Hive, which the feature store builds on, and the feature store itself. We don't need airflow, so I'll just leave that unchecked. Okay, so the feature store has been enabled. We can click on the feature store button here just to see if there's anything there. And there's not much. It says we can create feature groups or new training data sets, but let's go and run our notebook in Jupyter. So now I've collect, uh, selected Jupyter. In this case, I don't need GPUs. So I'm going to go to Spark Static. And we can see it's a, it's giving me a driver with four cores and an executor with four cores and 12 gigs of memory. And that's fine by me. So I'm clicking on the Start button now. This is going to launch a new tab. You may need to approve the tab being launched by your browser. I've done that already. So that's OK. And now I'm going to go to the Serving um, folder down here because that's where scikit-learn is. We've already, in a previous video, we did model serving for TensorFlow. In this case, we're going to go to the sklearn folder. And you can see there's two files here. One is the Iris Flare Classifier Python file. We're going to use that later on to make predictions. Um, but we're going to open the notebook file, the IPython notebook file first. <laughs> so our IPython notebook file here is quite a long one. It starts out by uh, telling us what it's going to do. I'm just going to run the first cell just to get the Spark application started. And then we'll go through briefly what's going to happen. So we're going to load the Iris Flare data set, which is a very well known data set for machine learning. It's a data set that contains a small number of, of flowers with four different features and then the class of flower. So uh, we're going to do a little bit of feature engineering on that data set, save those features to our feature store. We're then going to generate training data from the feature data in the feature store, train a model using scikit-learn. Um, we're then going to launch a serving instance to serve the trained model and send some prediction requests to it. Now, this particular notebook is running Python 3.6, so I'm going to skip the last part of monitoring the predictions through Kafka, but predictions will be logged to a topic in Kafka, so you can uh, run that code separately, and typically it would run in a separate uh, long-lived process, a streaming application such as PySpark. Okay, let's see what's happening. So the, the Spark session is uh, being created. We can now read in our data set it's in. We can see this telling us it's in our project inside test job data iris iris CSV. We can go back and have a look at that data. So if we go to the data sets folder here, we can see the test job folder and inside data we have iris and we can see RSCSV. It's not a very large data set. And you can see there's uh, there's some labels for each of the columns, sepal length, width, petal length, petal width, and then the class, the variety, setosa being the name there. Okay, let's go back to our notebook. So we read up the data set. We can have a look at the schema. And those are the four features that we mentioned and then the class called variety. Now this variety, as we saw, was a categorical variable. We're going to use a string indexer to encode that. And um, what we'll end up with, we can see below, is basically 
a nice uh, integer label for the uh, for the class and then we're also going to take our features the set length width length and width and make them all doubles they were already but we can go ahead and do that we now have a data frame that will have just numeric values in it so we can see this is our data frame and it has just numeric features and we can just show the first three examples we have um oh, this is the lookup data set so the lookup data set is defined earlier on it's basically saying give me the uh, distinct varieties that are available in this data frame as telling us there's three distinct varieties virginica versicolor and setosa so the next more interesting step is how can we make these features available to other people who'd like to maybe use those features in models and we can do that by creating a feature group with this data frame iris underscore df3 and that will basically store the four features in our iris data frame into the feature store in a, something called a feature group and that feature group will be called iris features iris underscore features and it also computed descriptive statistics correlation um, matrix histograms cluster analysis for the features so there is some metadata about the features that we can now go back and look at so let's also run the next one it's going to create a feature group for the RS labels lookup we let that run and we'll go back to our feature store so now we're back looking at our feature store and what we should see is that we can see the RS features feature group has been created so we have our feature groups here and then we have the individual features here and training sets that are created from feature groups from sets of features and feature groups that come from feature groups will um, we haven't got we haven't created any yet so there shouldn't be any there so if we look at training data sets we can see there are none but there should be four features we can see we have the four features in our iris data set and we also have then the label which is uh, <coughs> the, the type of flare now if we go back to our feature group what we're all also able to see is the computed statistics about our feature group so if we click on the green button the red one will delete this feature group so we won't click on that we'll click on the green button and what we can see is a number of different um, statistics for our feature group we can look at the correlations of the features we can see some there and we can look at some clustering analysis for the features and there's some clusters there and we can look at descriptive statistics the counts of the different values the, the mean values standard deviation mins and maxes for them and we can see them all them all here that's kind of interesting so this is what a data scientist will typically do when they uh, start addressing a problem they'll look at the available features they'll look at they'll try to understand the data distribution and the type of data in those features and before they actually go ahead and, and design models so if we go back to our notebook um, what we can see is we now have done some feature engineering registered the features that are available in the feature store and uh, what we can do is we can read the training data set from the feature store so what we can say is because we have a feature group called iris features we can say oh, i'd like that feature group iris features and give it back to me as a pandas data frame so we're going to ask for a pandas data frame and this train df will be a pandas data frame and we get it back so let's just run these this cell and then we can describe it and when that that's run what we're, what we're going to do is we can see now there's some statistics over the the pandas data frame um, but what we want to do now is we want to generate some a, a, a training data set and a test data set so at the moment we, we can see we've got our training data set here this is the data frame xdf and ydf as our labels the, the class of the the flowers in this case and let's run this and what we can do now is we can use a k nearest neighbors classifier to try and train a model to predict based on the features what class of uh, flower we have and so we've done that now and this 
iris underscore knn is our is our model what we can actually do is we can serialize or pickle that model into a file iris underscore knn dot pkl and copy it into our file system hdfs so we've done that now we can go back to hdfs just to check and make sure that that file is there it should have been copied into the resources folder here and we can see that it is here so iris underscore knn dot pkl has been copied in here and if we go back we and we continue what we now have is a model that's available in our file system can be used by applications to make predictions about iris flowers given some feature data and what we want to do now is make that model available over the network we want to serve it so what we're going to do is we're going to take the the pickled file this iris knn we're going to call serving.export it and we're going to give the model a name which we've done up here so we have the name iris flower classifier and we have serving version one and that will basically if we click on run this one here 15 this will basically export our model and make it available so to serve this model we have a python script that downloads the hfs model and the constructor and saves it as a class variable and implements the predict method in this particular class and classify and regress so this is very similar to tensorflow model serving so um, you can read more details on this uh, in your own time so if we go back to our data sets here and if we go to our models folder we can see that the model was exported in here the rs flower classifier its version number was one and this is our model so it's now officially available as a model in our models data set so so we can actually then just show that it's here this is doing what i did from the user interface and in this case we're going to run the next line which is basically going to call serving.creator update and that's going to basically yeah update the the model file that was it already existed so um after the serving has been created we can we'd like to make it available as a as a model over the network by the hopsource rest api <coughs> So what we're going to do is use the, using the uh, REST API for Hopsworks. Um, we're just going to get some meta information about that particular model file. We can see that's not being served right now. We call serving.status the name of the file and it's got, it says it's stopped. So all we need to do is call serving.start on the name and it will start this model being served. So we can actually track this in the user interface by going back to our model serving uh, service here and we can see that the model in fact is being served and we have a bunch of options over here so we can look at the logs for the model as it's being served um, it's going to pull them out of Kibana so we can see them in this is the the scikit learning server model logs and we can kind of filter them and if you want to even graph them or something you can do that in Kibana um, but what we can also do is more interestingly is we can get the endpoint for the model and an external application outside of Hopsworks could take this endpoint and then create an inference token and this is our JWT token which will have a very long expiry time and then and it can be invalidated at a later stage or just by removing my user from the project will invalidate that token and then at a later stage we can now use that model over the network so so in this case it's okay so what we're going to do now is we're going to send some prediction requests to the model that's being served over the Huff or Express API and um, what we're going to do first is we're going to get a topic name for uh, for this particular model so the topic name hasn't printed out here let's have a quick look so the the topic name we can go back and find it out if we go to kafka so the kafka option here will show us the topic that was created uh, to store the logs for the predictions 
and there's a schema for it as well if you um, care to look the scheme will actually be available in here in schemas <coughs> you can see it's in for schema um, the contents too it's not formatting very well but we can see that there's a, a model name model version and so on okay so let's go ahead and make some predictions so these predictions are, are making server inference requests on the model we're getting some predictions back and then that's basically it so we've now made some predictions from the notebook over the network we're serving the model over the network and we trained it from feature data and training data generated from the feature store and we registered those features in the feature store so we can let this run or we can stop the model from being served by clicking on stop and you can also have a separate spark streaming application which will uh, monitor the prediction requests and responses using Kafka and you can see some example code here but this is written for Python 2.7 which won't work in my particular notebook. Okay, that's the end of the video.